Let's stand together and take our Bibles and turn to John 16. And uh, there's so many things a preacher would like to say when I hear about letting freedom ring and I hear all the edicts and the mandates coming out of Washington these days, but I'm going to stay with my notes and ask you to turn to John chapter 16 as we begin this brand new series today entitled Overcomer, and I trust that you're ready to receive a blessing this morning. How many of you are glad you're in church today? Amen? Amen. There's no place I'd rather be, and I hope that you feel the same. Now this morning, we're going to have an, an introduction to the uh, teachings concerning overcoming. Uh, I want to say the doctrine of the overcomer. That's what we're going to learn this morning, just as an overview introduction to this theme. And then we're going to take 10 to 12 weeks, and we're going to study the lives of individual people in the Bible who overcame and how they were able to overcome. And so this morning, we're going to begin with the words of Jesus 
uh, as he promises that we can overcome and that we will. Let's begin in verse 29 of John 16. His disciples said unto him, Lo, now speakest thou plainly, and speakest no proverb. Now are we sure that thou knowest all things, and needest not that any man should ask thee. By this we believe that thou camest forth from God. Jesus answered them, Do ye now believe? Behold, the hour cometh, yea, is now come, that ye shall be scattered, every man to his own, and shall leave me alone. And yet I am not alone, because the Father is with me. These things have I spoken unto you, that in me ye might have peace. In the world ye shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. Let's read verse 33 together, shall we? Ready, begin. These things have I spoken unto you, that in me ye might have peace. In the world ye shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. Let us pray. Father, please forgive us for those times when we forget your word. Forgive us for being so surprised when tribulation comes. Mature our faith. And then once we come to that place of trust, would you help us to overcome? I know that behind every face this morning, there is one or two or several tribulation, times of tribulation represented. And I pray that you would help each of us during this series to learn how to overcome the challenges we're facing. And I ask that many would be saved in these upcoming weeks because there is no greater way to overcome than through salvation in Jesus Christ, in whose name I pray, amen. You may be seated. The disciples were overcome with fear and concern regarding their future. They were concerned about their future. They were concerned about the Lord's future. Often they did not understand his prophecies concerning his death, burial, and resurrection. They had assumed that perhaps Christ, the Messiah, would help them to overcome the Roman government and that they would establish some type of a peace immediately on earth. They assumed that things would get better and better and better, and yet it appeared that there was going to be times of trial before there would be times of blessing. And that concerned them. And times of trial sometimes concern us. Many of us sense times of trial as they're boiling over in our country and in the inner cities of our country and around the world. There seems to be so much trouble today. And sometimes the emotions of fear can grip our heart. This is why in one of his meetings with the disciples in John 14, Jesus simply said to them, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. I go to prepare a place for you, that where I am there ye may be also. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again. Why was Jesus saying this? Because he could sense the fear in the heart of his disciples. In 35 years of pastoring here at Lancaster Baptist Church, I have seen us as a church, as a nation, come through seasons of fear. We're experiencing some of that now. But I remember vividly 911, as do you. And as a pastor, what I remember the most was the fear that gripped the hearts of God's people. Many times I would speak to a widow in our church who would watch news incessantly and was fearful that a bomb was going to drop just any moment again. There was a literal, palpable fear in the nation right after 911. I remember it as a pastor because people would come into this house of worship throughout the days for weeks following, simply coming in to pray 
simply coming in to seek God and to try to find understanding. Through that period of time, God began to give hope, and some came to know the Lord as Savior, and others, with a few years passing, seemed to completely forget what had happened, which is why we paused this morning to remember. There's something about human nature that wants to just move along and not have any tribulation. But as Jesus prepares for his death, burial, and resurrection, the disciples many times struggled with the thought of tribulation and trials that could come. In fact, the Bible tells us in John 16 and 19, now Jesus knew that they were desirous to ask him and said unto them, do ye inquire among yourselves of that I said, a little while and ye shall not see me, and again a little while and ye shall see me? He says, are you guys talking about what I've been trying to tell you that in a little while I'm going to be gone and, and then after a while after that I'll see you again? They were trying to get their brains around it. It's not what they wanted to hear. They didn't want to hear that Jesus was ever going to leave them. They wanted life to be better every step of the day without trials in their lives. John 16 and 32 says, Behold, the hour cometh, yea, is now come, that ye shall be scattered, every man to his own, and shall leave me alone. And yet I am not alone, because the Father is with me. Imagine how they must have felt when the Lord says to these disciples, there is coming a time when you're going to completely scatter. You're going to leave me. And we're going to see in just a moment, he was not telling them this to discourage them. He was telling them this to prepare them for things to come. This morning, I want to share three truths with you as we face uncertain times. Three ways that we can understand how to be an overcomer even when we live in fearful times. I want you to notice, first of all, this morning, the provision of peace that comes from God. The provision of peace. Verse 33, these things have I spoken unto you that in me ye might have peace. The Lord looked into the hearts of his disciples. He could see the anxiety. He could sense the frustration. He could, under, he could sense that they couldn't really understand. And so the first promise that he gives in this great verse is that there is a provision of peace for them. Where does that peace come from? Peace comes, first of all, in the understanding of the providence of God. The providence of God. Jesus said, these things have I spoken unto you. These things relative to my death. These things relative to my departure. These things relative to your being scattered. I'm telling you all these things not to take away your peace, but so that when they come, you'll be able to say, oh, God already said this would happen. You see, the providence of God is something that all of us should be able to settle in. Uh, I remember when this whole journey of COVID began, and boy, was it a roller coaster and between health officials and legal people and, and medical and just trying to understand every day how to, how to manage through it. There was a point fairly early on, maybe a month or two into it, I just remember getting down on my knees and saying, Lord, this is obviously something so out of my control. Help me today just to trust in your providential care for my life and to recognize that you are sovereign and that you are allowing this for a reason. How many of you are thankful that God sees all of this before it ever happens? Amen. Nothing catches our God by surprise. He Notice the words in verse 33. These things have I spoken unto you. He is speaking these words not to trouble them, but to prepare them. When he said, I'm going to leave, when he said, you're going to be troubled at that, you're going to scatter. He was not trying to trouble them. He was trying to prepare them. Providence describes God's use of his knowledge, his plan, and power to fulfill his purposes in creation, in, in the lives of all of mankind. Providence is God's way of showing how that he has a plan for our lives. In your notes, in Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 8, the Bible says, Wherein he hath abounded toward us in all wisdom and prudence, having made known unto us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure, which he hath purposed in himself, 
that in the dispensation of the fullness of times he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth, even in him. And so we see here the providence of God in verse 33. He said, I'm speaking to you about things that are yet to come. I want you to know that I see before what is going to happen. This biblical term is from the Greek word prognosis and simply means to know in advance. And Jesus Christ knew in advance that he would die and that he would raise up again and that after that he would see his disciples again. And ladies and gentlemen, that is precisely why he is the God that we worship today. Amen. He prophesied his own death, burial, and resurrection. He alone has the providence to give insight into our lives and what is happening in our lives. We see this throughout the Bible. We'll see it in the weeks to come as we study the life of Joseph. And you'll recall how that Joseph was uh, placed into slavery by his own brothers, how that uh, he was uh, ill-treated and ultimately rose to much power uh, in Egypt. And in Genesis 50 and verse 20, as he finally saw his brothers coming back begging for food, and as they were trembling for their lives, thinking that perhaps he would bring retribution upon them, Joseph said, but as for you, you thought evil against me, but God meant it unto good to bring to pass as it is this day to save much people alive. You, you see, Joseph understood then that God had a reason for selling him into slavery. And God had a reason for uh, separating him from his family. That though his brothers meant it for evil, God meant it for good. And I don't care if it is an edict from Washington, D.C. that troubles you, or if there's someone at work that troubles you, or your finances, or your health. Always remember that you have a God who has seen before. And according to Romans 8, 28, we know that all things work together for good to them that love God and are the called according to his purpose. God, in his providence, is working on our behalf. One of the amazing things that came out of the attack on 911 was that despite the loss of nearly 3,000 lives, that there were other thousands of lives that were saved on that day. When the planes hit, many had not yet come to the towers for work. Many of them had been delayed. Some of them were late. Some of them had run various different errands along the way. Uh, one fellow was picking up donuts for the office that day. The portion of the Pentagon that the plane crashed into just happened to be the part that had just been reinforced. And the steel reinforcements saved many, many lives in the Pentagon that day. The fact is that even in the times of hardship and trials, God's providential care can be seen. That even when we're going through difficulty in our lives, if we will look, we will see God in those very moments. And so we see uh, that the providence of God uh, helps us to experience the peace of God. Just resting in the fact God is in control. God knows the way that I take. And when I am tried, I shall come forth as gold. And so peace is seen in the providence of God. This is simple, but it is truly biblically profound. God is in control even at this very moment. Never forget that. He's in control. Peace is found in the providence of God. But I want you to notice, secondly, peace is found in the person of Christ. Now, notice what it says in verse 33. These things have I spoken unto you that in me you might have peace. Notice the words in me. Let's say that together. In me. Here we learn that we not only have peace because of God's overriding providential care, but also because of his personal indwelling in our life. We learn here that there is peace in this relationship with Christ. Now that peace first begins when you accept Jesus as your Savior, for the Bible is very clear. There is no peace until you know God. Notice what the Bible says in Romans chapter 5 and verse 1. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom also we have access by faith into this grace, wherein we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. Now think about those words in verse 1. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God. 
people who do not know Christ, who've never put their faith in Christ, do not have peace with God. I was thinking yesterday as we had the home going for Brother Ali and so grateful for the peace that he had right up until the very moment that God called him home. And yet I often watch people in services like this and I watched people in that service yesterday. People that don't know God and when you begin to preach about Jesus, they start looking at other things. They start looking up. They're uncomfortable with it because they don't know if they died that they would spend eternity in heaven. They don't have peace with God, but I'm here to tell you, my friend, that if there was a bomb that exploded today where you live, I want you to understand that if Christ is in you, you can have peace knowing that you will spend eternity in heaven with Jesus Christ. Before you can have the peace of God, you must have peace with God. And it is only through salvation in Christ that we can have peace with God, that we are reconciled to God. Notice in your notes, Romans chapter 5 and verse 10. For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. And not only so, but we also joy in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom we now have received atonement. Now, uh, many times today, churches use uh, translations of Scripture that sort of dumb down these doctrinal words. Uh, I would rather read these doctrinal words and define them to you than just take them out. So let's look at two doctrinal words this morning. First of all, notice in verse number 10, the word reconciled. Reconciled. When you are saved, you are reconciled to God. To reconcile means to be returned to favor with that though our sins separated us from God, now we are in favor with God. Now we have his favor. And oh, what a blessing to know that in Christ we are found in God's favor. How many of you are thankful for that? Amen. We're not separated from God. He's not angry uh, today at his children. He hates sin, but we who are saved are reconciled. Then notice the second word in verse 11, the word atonement. That is, again, uh, restoration of favor. Uh, that is the adjustment of a difference. This word atone comes from the, the 1300s, and uh, it's uh, out of an archaic English uh, uh, phraseology uh, where two people were found in agreement. They were united together, and where they were said to have been brought into a state of unity, or more simply put, they were at one. When two people who were at odds found agreement with one another, it was said that they were at one. What does the word atonement mean? It means that we are at one with God. How many of you are grateful for that this morning? We have been atoned. And so at salvation, when you accepted Christ as Savior, you became at one with God. You found peace with God. There was a burden lifted off of your shoulders because you were atoned for. And so at salvation, we find peace. And then throughout life as a believer, we can walk with this peace. John 14 and 27 says, peace I leave with you. My peace I give unto you, not as the world giveth give I unto you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. Jesus said, listen, I want to leave my peace with you. I want you to know my peace in in uncertain times, I want you to rest in my peace and in my presence. Sometimes uh, we can live our lives sort of like the battered fighter in the boxing ring, and he heard his trainer every time between rounds, this fighter, the trainer would say to him, champ, you're doing great. Uh, he, he hasn't laid a glove on you. You're doing great. And the fighter looked at his trainer and said, well, you better keep an eye on that referee then because somebody in that ring is beating the daylights out of me. <laughs> Some days we feel that way, don't we? We, we feel like we're just getting beat up in this life. But God says, I want you to know I'm with you. My peace is with you. It's salvation in our life. And how does that happen? How is his peace with us? It is by the presence of his Holy Spirit. Romans 15 and verse 13. Now the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing that ye may abound in hope through the power of the Holy Ghost. How do we abound in hope, Pastor? Through the power of the Holy Ghost. Let's say that together. Through the power of the Holy Ghost. You see, the Spirit of the living God lives inside a Christian. And that is why God says, I'm going to provide peace for you. That is why God says, I'm going to go with you. And you can abound over this time of tribulation. Uh, C.S. Lewis said, God cannot give us a happiness and peace apart from himself because it is not there. 
Friend, do you know the Lord is your Savior today? And if you do, then let his spirit bring peace into your life today. The provision of peace comes from the Lord himself. And so it is. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. We see the provision of peace. But notice, secondly, the presence of tribulation. Someone says, well, pastor, that's great. I'm saved. I'm at peace with God at one. I'm thankful for that, but you don't understand. I've got trials right now. I've got, I've got stuff on me right now. It's heavy right now. Yes, Jesus said that would happen. Again, in verse 33, in the world, ye shall have tribulation. Aren't you thankful for the truthfulness of the Bible? In the world, you're, you shall have tribulation. Now, in John 16 and verse 1, notice, if you would, these words. These things have I spoken unto you, that you should not be offended. They shall put you out of the synagogues. Yea, the time cometh that whosoever killeth you will think that he doeth God service. <laughs> you all reading the Bible with me this morning? He says there's going to come a time when Christians are seen as so pesky and divided and opinionated about this Jesus Christ. Jesus says to his disciples, there will be people that will take your lives and think they did something good. By the way, is that not what the apostle Paul was doing just years after this verse? Is that not something that's been happening since then? Verse three, and these things will they do unto you because they have not known the father nor me, but these things have I told you that when the time shall come, ye may remember that I told you of them. And these things I said unto you at the beginning because I was with you. He is warning his children. He is warning us that if you intend to truly live for Jesus, not everyone's going to appreciate that. Now, don't try to make every one of your personal preferences or patriotic sensations a matter of your current persecution. But there is a clearly divided line, and that is the doctrines of Christ. And if you intend to live for Jesus Christ and to witness for Christ and to be unashamed for Christ, just know there are going to be people that hate you for what you say about Jesus Christ. There will be tribulation because of your faithfulness or in times of your faithfulness. Did you see that in verse 32? Behold, the hour cometh, yea, is now come, that ye shall be scattered. In other words, they were going to be fleeing. They were going to be discouraged. They were going to be running. The Bible says in 2 Timothy 3 and 12, yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. But evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. Now, I could go on with these verses. Let me tell you what. This is not how you build a following, someone might say to Jesus Christ. <laughs> how are you ever going to get followers if you keep telling them, follow me? You'll, you'll be killed shortly, but follow me. <laughs> Evil men and seducers are going to wax worse and worse, and all that will live godly in Christ is you're going to be persecuted, but follow me. Uh, you're going to be hated, but follow me. Jesus was simply prophesying the world's attitude toward Christ. 1 Peter 2.21 says it this way. For even hereunto were ye called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example, that ye should follow his steps. Say that phrase with me. That ye should follow his steps. One more time. That ye should follow his steps. How many of you love Jesus this morning? Amen. Can I remind you how he died? You say, Pastor, are you kind of hopeful at that? No, I don't, I don't hope that for anybody. I don't hope that you have to put on a Band-Aid later on today. I'm just telling you, if they hated our Savior, they may hate us through this life. He said, in the world, you will have tribulation. On the grounds of 9 -1 -1 Memorial, and it's, it is truly spectacular uh, the way that uh, those grounds have been rebuilt. But there's a, a, a calorie pear tree known as the survivor tree. This tree was just a small tree that uh, had begun to grow, and yet when the wreckage came down, was completely crushed. And somehow, when they began to take the steel and the debris away from this tree, it was just kind of leaned over, 
bark scraped off, most of the leaves off, but somebody said, you know what, if I can get the roots and if I can get what's left of that, and they took it over to the Bronx to a nursery where the Department of, uh, uh, of uh, Parks began to work on that tree and fertilize that tree and trim that tree, and they brought it back and they planted it here. It's known as the survivor tree. And as you think about that with me, understand that even in tribulation and trial, God can still grow your faith. And sometimes it's actually the tribulations that drew grow our faith. It's the tribulations that cause us to really trust in him. And tribulations are prophesied. And tribulation should be expected. I want you to look at your notes and see this with me. First Peter 4 and verse 12. Beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you, as though some strange thing happened unto you. Beloved, don't think this is strange. Don't, don't think it's strange when people at work think you're weird for following God or following Jesus Christ. Don't think it's strange when you uh, experience difficulty for your faith. Jesus said, in the world we'll have tribulation. Beloved, think it not strange. Verse 13 but rejoice in so much as ye are partakers of Christ's sufferings that when his glory shall be revealed ye may be glad also with exceeding joy if you in following the word of God suffer trials and temptations discrimination and hatred then remember what Jesus said in the world you will have tribulation you will have tribulation there will be tribulation because of faithfulness. There'll be tribulation in discipleship. You see, discipleship and following Jesus was never portrayed in the Bible as just a Sunday thing and put a little bumper sticker on your car. No, he said, no man that, that followeth me put his hand to the plow and looketh back. He said, if you're going to follow me, take up your cross and follow me. Be willing to identify with my sufferings. Notice uh, what true disciples do. They stay with Jesus Christ. Notice in John 6, 6 and verse 60, it says, many therefore of his disciples, when they heard this, his, his teaching, uh, this, they said, this is a hard saying. Who can hear it? When Jesus knew in himself that his disciples murmured at it, he said unto them, Doth this offend you? What and if ye shall see the Son of Man ascend up where he was before? It is the spirit that quickeneth, the flesh profiteth nothing. The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. But there are some of you that believe not. Again, God knows. God knows. For Jesus knew from the beginning who they were that believed not and who should betray him. And he said to them, Therefore said I unto you that no man can come unto me except it were given unto him of my father. Verse 66. From that time many of his disciples went back and walked no more with him. Many times when trials come and sometimes when truth is presented, there will be those who turn away and walk away from Jesus Christ. There will be the separation of the wheat and the chaff. And here we see in John chapter 6 and verse 66, from that time there were many that turned back and walked no more with him. I want you to understand the true disciples stayed. Those that were there for the show, those that were there for the Christian school, those that were there for the program, those that were there just to get help for their marriage, those that were there just to get what they could get out of it, they were gone as soon as they heard something they didn't like. Everybody with me this morning? But the others, when they heard this strong doctrine, they stayed. Why? Because they had truly believed on the Lord Jesus Christ. As the coming of the Lord draws nigh, there will no doubt be these challenges in our lives. Some will say, ah, it's getting a little tough to be a Christian. It's been real. See you later. And others will say, Lord, to whom shall we go? Thou hast the words of eternal life. Where else can we possibly go? True disciples stay with Jesus. Would you say that with me? True disciples stay with Jesus. And true disciples sometimes suffer with Jesus. Acts 14.22 says that the early churches confirmed the souls of the disciples and exhorted them to continue in the faith and that we, through, that we must through much tribulation enter into the kingdom of God. You know, most of us, when we got saved, we're like, hey, I want to enter the kingdom of God. Yes, sign me up. I want Jesus as my Savior. Forgive my sins, Lord, and take me to heaven. That is awesome. But the Bible actually also says that 
we through much tribulation will enter into the kingdom of God. Now, we don't have to know every verse of the Bible in order to be saved. How many of you are thankful that we can turn to the Lord Jesus Christ and be saved simply by calling on him in faith? But from the time we're saved until the time God calls us home, there may be times of tribulation. Captain Joshua Byers gave his last full measure of devotion in Ramadi, Iraq on July 23rd, 2003. He was a West Point graduate and the commander of Fox Troop. Just four months into the 911 war with Iraq. And as Joshua was serving one day, a bomb exploded underneath him, not far from the base camp where they had left with their convoy. Before he died, Josh gave one last commandment to his troops, and this is what he said. Keep moving forward. Keep moving forward. And that convoy did exactly what he said, and because of that, when further fire came upon them just a few minutes later, their lives were spared. Because of this simple command, keep moving forward. When you sense the artillery of Satan coming down, and when you see even the casualties around you, people you never thought that would quit, people who just don't seem to have any spiritual fervor, and, and, and you're surprised at times. I've been surprised over the years. I believe the Word of God would say to all of us, keep moving forward. Because the longer we delay and the longer that we wonder why is this happening and this isn't fair, the more we may stay in harm's way. The provision of peace is available. The presence of tribulation was foretold. But notice thirdly and finally, the promise to overcome. The promise to overcome. The Bible says in verse 33, these things have I spoken unto you that in me you might have peace. In the world ye shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. Folks, if there's a place where we ought to be of good cheer, it's at Lancaster Baptist Church. Jesus is our Savior. We're on the winning side. The infallible Word of God is in our hearts. Jesus Christ is coming again. We need to be of good cheer. Hey, this does not need to be a place where we're going, oh, did you hear what happened? Oh, this country's getting terrible. Oh, my favorite team lost its game. Whatever the case might be. Listen, this ought to be the place where we can say, hey, we're on the winning side this morning. We know that we're on the winning side in Jesus Christ. If Jesus would indeed be crucified, then it would appear to the disciples that the world had overcome Jesus, and hence they would scatter. And this is why Jesus kept telling them, you'll see me again. I will come again. How does Jesus overcome? What is the basis of the doctrine of the overcomer? Well, Jesus overcomes by the resurrection, by the resurrection from the dead. 1 Corinthians 15 and 19, if in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men most miserable, but now is Christ risen from the dead and become the first fruits of them that slept. Listen, our Savior is a risen Savior, and we who are in Christ, Jesus was the first fruits, but we are following after him. So how does Jesus say, I've overcome the world? And why do we say that we are overcomers in Christ? Because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. We serve the only God who ever conquered death and the grave. And the basis for our resurrection is his resurrection. And the basis for our hope is his finished work. And that's why we can celebrate even in the worst of times because of what Jesus has done for us. 1 Corinthians 15, 55. Karen, think of this this morning. O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be unto God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as ye know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. I've seen Christians when times get tough, and, and maybe they're having troubles at work, and maybe they tithe, but they didn't get a big blessing or a big bonus or whatever they were expecting in their mind. Maybe one of their children uh, isn't living for God the way they thought it would all work out. Maybe they're having a little bit of marital difficulty. And somewhere along the way, uh, they just kind of quit. They just think, well, I tried that religion. I tried that God stuff, and it just didn't work out. No, no, no. God says, wait a minute. Therefore, my beloved, be steadfast, 
be unmovable. Don't quit. Understand that you are on the victory side even when you're going through trials. If you're in Christ, you can have his peace and you will have his presence. Oh, what a blessing to know that the resurrection is the basis for our overcoming doctrine. Henry Morris wrote, the bodily resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead is the crowning proof of Christianity. If the resurrection did not take place, then Christianity is a false religion. If it did take place, then Christ is God and the Christian faith is absolute truth. Ladies and gentlemen, this morning Christianity begins where all the religions of the world end at death. And it starts with the resurrection. And the reason that we are overcomers is because Christ is the first fruits of the resurrection. And we know that we will see him once again. Oh, listen, you cannot be threatened by this world. You have life eternal in Jesus Christ. This is something that the martyrs of the Reformation understood. This is why Latimer and Ridley, before they were burned at the stake in Oxford by bloody Queen Mary, this is why they could say things like, play the man, Ridley. Tomorrow we shall be in the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ. This is why John Huss, before they lit the sticks beneath his feet and burned his body. This is why he rejoiced and sang hymns all night. This is why he said publicly, those things that I taught with my lips, I now seal with my blood. This is why our heritage, this trail of blood, our Baptist heritage, our Christian heritage is filled with men and women who actually believe what God said in his word. They believe that to be absent from the body was to be present with the Lord. Jesus overcomes by the resurrection and we overcome by faith in the resurrection. We overcome by faith in God. Notice in your notes, a very key verse. I want you to get the doctrine of the overcomer. 1 John 5, 4. For whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world. And this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. Who is he that overcometh the world, but he that believeth that Jesus is the Son of God. Friend, do you believe that Jesus is the Son of God? Then you are an overcomer today. You have overcome by faith in Jesus Christ and faith in his promises. First Peter chapter 1 and verse 6, wherein ye greatly rejoice, though now for a season, if need be, ye are in heaviness through manifold temptations, that the trial of your faith being much more precious than of gold that perisheth, though it be tried with fire, might be found unto the praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. Can I encourage you, friends, this morning? Peter said, though you now greatly rejoice, though now you're going through some trials and tribulations, but he said, let the trial of your faith be like that which bringeth forth precious gold. Let God use the trials you're facing to really purge you, to purify you, to cause you to seek him more fervently, as we come through trials and tribulations in our nation, as we see so much hypocrisy, as we are often discouraged, let these things drive you to God. Let these things purify your life for God. The resurrection of Christ is the amen of all his promises. It is his way of saying, I am on the victor's crown. I have the victor's crown. I'm on the right hand of God the Father. On September 18th, 2001, just one week after 911, there was an architect named David Childs. And without being commissioned or asked, he sat down one day and sketched out a rough idea of what the rebuilding of the World Trade Center complex could look like. He just took out a pencil and paper and began to draw. The centerpiece was the tower's footprints, and he imagined a new skyscraper about 2,000 plus feet. Many architects say that after he received the opportunity to design the new tower, it was uncanny how accurately his design matched what is actually built today. It was uncanny how that in that moment of tragedy came such inspiration. Vision is not always found on a refreshing retreat. It's often created in the crucible of harsh reality. Don't run from the tribulation. God may be doing something great in your life through this tribulation. 
And here is a man who created the footprint of what is arguably one of the most beautiful buildings in all of the United States of America, all of the world. And it didn't happen during the good times. It didn't happen on vacation. It happened in a moment of anguish and sorrow, perhaps tears coming down his face. And yet in that moment, God gave him the inspiration. We should approach the coming of our Lord with excitement that God's going to give us the inspiration. God's going to help us through. He's going to show us how. And there must be vision that comes from the trial. You see, this, this opportunity that we have to overcome by faith, it is born of God, but also uh, it is based on the blood of Jesus Christ. We put our faith in God, but it is through his son, Revelation 12 and 11, and they overcame him by the blood of the lamb. Do you see it again? The word overcame. They overcame by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony, and they loved not their lives unto to the death. You see, when you study the martyrs, when you study those who have overcome and who will overcome, it is always because of faith in God. It is always because of faith in the blood of Jesus Christ. And that faith is produced by the Holy Spirit of God. It is something uh, that is given to them that they might know uh, that God is with them. First John 4 and 4. Notice that in your notes. It says, ye are of God, little children, and have overcome them Because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Now, what's got you down? What are you concerned about? Is it health? Is it COVID? Is it the economy? Is it political restructuring? What is it? Read this verse with me, 1 John 4, 4. Would you read it together? Ready, begin. Ye are of God, little children, and have overcome them. Because than he that is in the world. 1 John 4, 4. Greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Say that with me. Greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. The Apostle Paul said it this way in Romans 8. Nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death nor life nor angels, nor principalities, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Friend, no matter what you're facing right now, Jesus loves you no less. Jesus Christ is thinking of you no less. You are on his mind today. He, in, in his providential care, he saw exactly what was coming to our country, exactly what was coming to our world. And what we must do is continue in faith, believing with our eyes upon him, knowing that all things will work together for good to those who love him. Wells Crowther was a 24-year-old equities trader working on the 104th floor of the South Tower on 911. He was a graduate of Boston College. His dad was a banker as well, and his dad was a volunteer fireman. His dad always carried with him a blue bandana, and so Wells carried with him a red bandana. It was kind of his trademark. He always had it in his pocket somewhere or somewhere around his person. Every day he'd come into work, this newly graduated young man with his red bandana. When American Flight 11 hit the North Tower, Wells called a friend and explained, I'm heading over there to help. Before he could make it down, United 175 slammed into the South Tower. Suddenly, his training kicked in. He donned his red bandana over his face to cover from the smoke. And everywhere he went, he wore that red bandana, up and down the stairs carrying people. He assisted people down the stairs and is known to have carried one woman 17 flights of stairs to safety. In the aftermath of 911, multiple people said, I don't, I don't know who it was. I don't know how I got out. There was just some guy with a red bandana. He kept coming back and back and bringing people back. I'm so thankful for the heroism of that day. But I'm here to tell you that as a sinner lost and on my way to hell, that Jesus Christ shed his red crimson royal blood on the cross of Calvary to bring me out from the penalty of sin. And this world is looking for people 
who like Wells with this red bandana will go out to others, hey, and maybe humiliate ourselves a little bit. Hey, we're having a friend day at our church. Here's a cookie. Come hear about Jesus Christ. Come learn how you can be an overcomer. We don't have to live the victimized life. We don't have to be a part of some group that's always trying to overcome. We have overcome in Jesus Christ. We in Christ are the overcomers. And we will prevail over this world, not because we're so great, but because he's so great. So let me encourage you this week. Put on your red bandana. Go out and find somebody, somebody who's hurting, somebody who's struggling, somebody who feels like the world's coming to an end and everybody's against them and tell them, hey, I can show you the way out. Let me show you. It's by the way of Jesus Christ. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. Let's stand together. Our Father in heaven, we pause now to thank you for the doctrine of the overcomer. We thank you that you promised that even in the midst of tribulation, we can have peace and we can rest in the fact that you have overcome. And right now, this morning, I want to pray for those that are having burdens. I want to pray that this message will be the beginning of a new chapter for them. I want to pray for those that have felt overcome by the world. I pray that they will overcome the world by faith in you. May this time of trial and tribulation be the time when branches spring forth and new life springs forth. May this be the time when new designs are drawn. May this be the time when greater works are done our heads bowed and eyes closed. I wonder how many of you would say, Pastor, I, I have to be honest. I have had a lot of burden in my heart. Sometimes it's tough to watch the bad guys win. Sometimes it's tough to see everything happening. But this message put it into perspective for me. And I'm not going to live like the victim. I'm going to live like the overcomer that I am in Jesus Christ. Pray, Pastor, pray for me that I will overcome during these days through my Lord and the presence of his Holy Spirit. Pray that I'll live the overcoming life. Would you lift your hand this morning if God's speaking to you? God bless you. In the world, you're going to have tribulation. How many here today would say, Pastor, pray for me. I'm going to take that red bandana of the gospel and I want to show people the way out. I want to help my friends and neighbors and loved ones know they don't have to suffer. I want to show them the way out towards Jesus Christ. Pray for me as we approach friend day that God would use me in that way. Would you lift your hand this morning? I want to be like that man with the red bandana. Amen. And then let me ask you this question this morning. Is there someone here, listen very carefully, someone here this morning, and you would say, Pastor Chapel, I'm not sure that I'm at one with God. I'm not sure that I've really ever had the atonement with God. And I'd like to know how I can be an overcomer with Christ. I'd like to know how my sins could be paid for and how I could live on the side of victory. And if there's somebody right now and you'd like to know how to be at one with God, you're not sure that you're on your way to heaven, you'd like to get this settled, you'd like to know that your sins are covered, I'd like to pray for you before I close, who's in this first service and you'd honestly and humbly say, Pastor Chapel, Pray for me. I need to be at one with God. I'm not right now, but I want to be. Pray for me. Would you lift your hand right now and just hold it up wherever you are. Just hold it up. If you need Christ as your Savior, we'll pray for you. Who's like that this morning? I want to be at one with God. Pray for me. Pray for me. Father, I pray for anyone in this room that is not at one with you. They've never been atoned. They've never understood the atonement. May they receive that atonement today. And I pray for Christians going through trials and tribulations that you would help them in these upcoming weeks to realize that we are overcomers. We are not victims. We are overcomers through Christ. And I pray that you'd help all of us to spread that news in these upcoming days. And I pray it all in Jesus' name.